Well, thanks to Felicity for that uh, fantastic introduction. I'm really, really um, greatly honoured, um, and I'm looking forward to serving a, a wonderful community, all you great people, uh, for the next two years. As Felicity said, uh, historians can make special contributions, I think, at uh, times of turbulence. It's no coincidence, probably, that uh, the greatest mainstream historian of education we've had in this country, Brian Simon, uh, was uh, president of BIRA at a time of immense instability in the 1970s, a time of conflict um, and con real, real difficulty. And I think we have such a time as, again today. But historians can also tell stories. And today I'd like to tell a few, uh, and I hope they'll, they'll be of, of interest. The first story I have to tell is about a small group of delegates who worked on classroom studies. At first, with about 20 taking part, then 80, people with similar interests from different disciplinary backgrounds coming together for the first time in an informal partnership. And this was the group that eventually led to BIRA. A planning group was set up to organize a meeting in Birmingham, October 1973, applied to the Department of Education and Science for a small pump priming grant, an application that was turned down for reasons that I hope we can look at a bit later. But they managed somehow to rustle together the money to hold an inaugural conference, again in Birmingham, in April 1974. Great oaks from little acorns, they do grow. We can look back with pride, I think, 43 years later, and consider how far the association has come since those days. Still just about within the professional memory, of some of those who remain active in the field. In my talk today, I'm wanting briefly to look at where we are today in 2017, and then to look back, if I may, at our history in its wider context, and particularly at our ideals of trying to represent our community. Then I'm wanting to discuss briefly three ongoing issues. First of all, about our location in relation to the academy on one side and the world of teachers on the other. Secondly, about the idea of interdisciplinarity. There, I said it rightly. I hope I'll say it again properly. <laughs> and what it means in our field. And thirdly, the relationship between education research and the education policies which are going on all the time. And finally, to sum up with the question, which way now? Today, for the first time, as we've heard, we've got over 2,000 members in this association. Membership has increased by an incredible 71% in the last five years. Our conference attracts, I've put here, nearly 1,000 delegates. Let's say 1,000 delegates, <laughs> with many coming from other countries around the world. In 2017, BIRA has awarded no fewer than 45 bursaries to support researchers to come to this conference to research students, to early career researchers, to teachers, practitioners, independent researchers, and researchers from other countries. A very warm welcome to you all, if I may say so. In 2017, BIRA is a registered charity with its own staff, 
running its own conferences and events. In 2017, Vera houses five research journals, over 30 special research groups, I think 33, and a very active blog, as we heard from Jerry this morning. We've hosted over 50 events in the past year, one a week. In 2017, Vera's well-established ethical guidelines are widely recognised as a basic and essential tool of our trade. In 2017, we've also launched a two-volume handbook of educational research in association with a publisher's page, SAGE. SAGE. <laughs> with a well-attended conference to follow this. And also collaborated with the Academy of Social Sciences in producing a very substantial, very important pamphlet, Making the Case for Education, which I do recommend you, you have a look for. And so, when we come to reflect on our development over this time, it's very easy to think about our progress, to reassure ourselves about our growth, to concentrate on our success. And this is also true, I think, when we think about ourselves as individuals, about what Vera means to us personally. And I suppose this means different things to all of us. For me, as an example, it brings back many happy memories of meetings attended over a quarter of a century. Friends and colleagues have shared research and ideas. Papers offered, prepared, given, papers turned down, fish and chips on Brighton Pier, definitely. I got a few, and even the odd presidential address. For me personally, it reminds me of helping an elderly Brian Simon to climb a rather rickety staircase. He was in a lot of pain at the time to attend a symposium, I think in 1994 in Oxford one of my first Vera conferences, and I think probably his, his final one. A very poignant moment, one of many thousands of moments that go to make up our shared history. And so, both as an institution and as individual members, our first instinct when we think about our past is to use it as a crutch to support and comfort us about our achievements and our values. And that's not wrong, it's not a bad thing to do. It's part of a sentimental attachment that we seek when we come together as a profession, as an academic community, in the space that we've carved out for ourselves over these years. But there's also another kind of story. It's somehow a little bit different and yet no less to be valued. And that's to look at ourselves critically as researchers, to seek some kind of critical distance in appraising our past development. Somehow not to flinch at that or to be afraid of doing so. And that's what it means to look at ourselves historically. That's much more difficult, more challenging. But it's also, I think, more interesting and equally fulfilling. Now, there are also different kinds of history that we can develop in understanding our past. One of these would be a straightforward institutional history, if you like, a house history. That would be about the growth of our association in a lot of detail, listing the presidents, their dates, identifying the locations of conferences, the numbers that have attended, the range of our interests. There are a lot of histories that are produced by all sorts of associations and societies, such as ours, often for anniversaries. Very important. Another kind of history is a history of ideas, which explores how ideas about education and educational research has developed over the decades and the role of Bira in supporting this and in helping them to develop. Again, it's not hard to find those kinds of histories 
and again they can fulfill an honourable and useful purpose. But I'm wanting today to try to recommend another approach to understanding our history, and that's that of social history. The relationship between ourselves as an institution of education and the changing society beyond. If you're going to do that, you need to try to understand how it fits in its wider context. The change and the continuity over the longer term. The processes of contestation between rival groups and approaches. And this is indeed what historians of education generally have tried to do basically over the last 40 years or so, influenced by broad developments in the practice and theory of history and pursued in the history of education since the heyday of Brian Simon in the 1960s. And it's this approach which is most likely, I think, to give us a critical purchase on our historical development as an association and to provide a framework that makes the fullest sense both of our past and of our current position. Now that's not to suggest that there's only one interpretation of our social history. That's always open to argument and debate. It is to contend that we must try to locate Vera in its broader context if we're to fully comprehend its ideals and aspirations, its achievements and the work still to be completed or undertaken. In terms of context, it's worth recalling that Beera's birth took place in particular circumstances that helped to shape its later growth. I'm not here thinking necessarily of the Swedish group ABBA, winning the Eurovision Song Contest, as it did that same month, in Brighton, hosted by Katie Boyle, singing Waterloo. Although this song does point out, and I'm not, not going to try to sing it, that the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself. I think uh, it's, it's Agatha, isn't it, who, who sings that much better than I would nor even of Leeds United winning the Football League Championship while Manchester United was relegated. The long hair, the flared trousers that were emblems of the era, at least for the men, remind us how long ago this was. John Pertwee, with the Brigadier up there, was still Doctor Who. Annie Walker still ruled at the Rovers' return where Ida Sharples and Minnie Caldwell, that's not Minnie Caldwell, by the way, reigned re regulars. But there were other seismic events, even more seismic than ever, taking place at this time. Edward Heath's Conservative government had just fallen from power in a general election billed as Who Rules Britain, leading to Harold Wilson becoming Prime Minister with a Labour minority government. Britain was beginning its long slide into social, economic and industrial divisions, with the UK economy entering recession. There was a three-day week, the Red Lion Square protest, IRE terrorism, all key features of the early months of 1974. Britain going very gingerly into the European economic community. We can remember this while in the United States, the President Richard Nixon was fighting off being impeached following the Watergate scandal. There was no Sex Discrimination Act until the following year, which was also the first United Nations International Year of Women. And in education, we were on the eve of a generation of radical educational change, as Prigg and Roberts have justly described it. Far-reaching controversy, underway over radical progressive teaching methods at William Tyndale Junior School. Reginald Prentice had just been installed as the new Secretary of State for Education and Science. James Callaghan's Ruskin College speech and the Great Debate were only a couple of years away, leading to over 40 years of active state intervention and neoliberal reform. In fact, Beer itself, we can say, 
was a product of a period of educational expansion, a growth in confidence, when there was very high expectation about what research could achieve. Government ministers anticipated it answering difficult strategic questions about whether to invest in smaller classrooms in primary schools or a higher school leaving age. One commentator predicted in 1969, educational research would soon produce results comparable to another area that they saw as similar, agriculture and applied science. So that it would soon provide a basis for guiding school practice. For example, about the teaching of reading, how wonderful that would be. But the new association had to learn to survive and to grow in a very different climate. It's surprising, I think, that we have so far no extended research-based analysis of the origins of our association beyond personal accounts and reminiscences. But then, until recently, there were few published histories of educational research in the UK. The work of our first president, John Nisbet, is certainly a great exception to that. And Brian Simon also took a great interest in this history. Martin Lorne, Ian Dury, have produced significant work on the Scottish Council for Research Education, which was very important in the 1920s. And I myself have been very interested in the history of educational research and its associated knowledge formation, educational studies, for quite some time. I think my presidential address today is my first attempt to try to focus on Bira in the same fashion. And we do have some primary source material. We've got an archive of Bira at the Modern Record Centre at Warwick University. We've got the papers at National Archives, and we've got some elsewhere. And this may help, to, I think, to bring us up to speed internationally. In the States, there's been a lot of interest for at least 10, 20 years. Uh, the most important work, I think, Ella Godliff Lagerman, An Elusive Science, and other contributions by people like David Labory. A really big, juicy, special issue of a journal produced by the American Association this year, Brits and Teenery, A Century of Discovery. In Europe as well, there's been key work by Rita Hofstetter, Bernard Schnooley. And here in the UK, it's been supported vigorously the last year or two by Jeff Whitty and John Furlong. So what were the ideas that motivated and helped to shape the nascent Bureau? And how far are they relevant and useful for us today in the 21st century? I think these fall broadly into five main categories. First of all, representing the community of educational researchers. Secondly, engaging with cognate institutions. Thirdly, liaising between the academy and the everyday work of teachers in schools. Fourthly, reconciling special interests within an interdisciplinary ideal. And fifthly, managing the growing interest and the demands of the state. All of these, I think, involve different kinds of notions of partnership, which I think is the key theme. Let's look initially at the first of these categories, representation and engagement at a national level. Other areas of study and research commonly had a national organisation, generally with an annual conference and a journal in which to publish relevant research. In education, this kind of coverage was only partial at best. The established cognates university uh, uh, disciplines and assumed some responsibility for supporting educational aspects. The British Association for the Advancement of Science, for Section L, the British Psychological Society with its Educational Psychology section, the S SCRE, as I've said, in Scotland, the National Foundation for Educational Research, the more recent British Sociological Association, 
and the Standing Conference on Studies in Education. All of these bodies provided support for research in particular areas. They all did important work, which deserve further research, to expel the historical roots of educational research in this country. But none of them, I think, managed to represent researchers in the field across Britain as a whole. And yet there was a great need for some kind of representation in defining the community. Concerns were widely expressed about both the limited amounts and the poor quality of educational research, particularly at a time when educational policy and planning were becoming prominent national issues. Nor was this research well regarded. A senior official at the Ministry of Education pointed out the more trained researchers were required, but that education was not highly esteemed as an area for research. And most professors of education had neither the quality nor the status to improve the situation. There had long been complaints about the lack of attention paid to research in education policy. In the 1940s, Fred Clark, the director of the Institute of Education in London, had observed caustically as you see here, that if we conducted our medical and engineering services and our industrial production with the same slipshod carelessness, the same disregard for precision of thought and language, the same wild and reckless policy of sentimentality or class prejudice or material interest masquerading as principle with which we carry on our public discussions about education, most patients would die most bridges would fall down, and most manufacturing concerns would go bankrupt. National education policy increasingly highlighted the importance of research based on ideas about effective scientific planning for improved society. The Crowther Report had a forward plan for education, pointed out the most extraordinary gaps in our knowledge of what goes on in the schools and technical colleges of today, let alone in the minds of their pupils. And there were several remedies proposed to address the problem. The first was to expand the research capacity of the ministry itself. So they established a research department, and that did have some effect. The Newsom report, the Robbins report, uh, the development of the schools council, these were important things which helped to raise the status, the fashionability of research uh, at a state level. The second approach, which was allied to the, research, to the first, was to provide more money for educational research. It was possible to provide grants for educational purposes under Section 100 of the 1944 Education Act. In England and Wales, if not in Scotland, but finance for educational research remained pitiable, as the Crowther Report put it. Special debate on educational research in the House of Commons in 1962 pointed out that the total amount spent on research into cast iron, welding and ceramics was in each category a quarter of a million pounds, or nearly twice the amount spent on educational research. More was known about training capstan lathe operators than about the training of classroom teachers. The ministry began to commission research, and that did grow. The schools council was financed by local educational authorities and soon had a budget of a million pounds a year. A third possibility was to launch a new research council specifically to support research in education. And though we're a long way from that today, that was a real possibility in the 1960s. It was re recommended that there should be an educational research council comparable in its constitution to the medical and agricultural research councils, and with a substantial budget granted by Parliament. And this was also supported in the House of Commons. In the end, they turned against this in favour of a broader social science research council, which had an education and research board which reported to it. But even this was slowly taken away over later years. And then the Social Science Research Council itself uh, turned into uh, what, what we have today, uh, a rather different kind of research council. <clears throat>
The fourth approach was to persist, despite everything, with supporting the university sector and to improve the development of educational research across the country as a whole. There was a lot of frustration about how slow progress was in building educational research, but a growth of optimism that educational research would become more prominent in the universities and that as some of the liveliest spirits among the professors made themselves increasingly felt, there could be a greater number of students attracted to follow their example. And so you started to get the growth of a few societies in education itself. The Society for Research in Higher Education, particularly interesting, I think, perhaps even more so than the nar narrower disciplinary uh, societies of philosophy and history, because it showed that it was possible to get a broader market of, of educators who worked in s single disciplines. But also you had the British Educational Research Ad 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 Administration Society, a new centre, Centre for Applied Research in Education, Centre for Studies in Education, uh, and others. These provided a basis for going forward with a general association uh, to cover the field as a whole. And this was what turned into Bira. There was an idea that they could follow a more quality idea of, of membership and only have a limited number of people in it. But they stuck to the idea that they should represent the whole of the community. In fact, they went strongly against the idea that, that it should be only, only quality based. But it was agreed at the meeting held in Birmingham in 73 that there should be an open membership it would be difficult to decide what would be the necessary qualifications. But it should have an academic orientation while recognising that there might well be political spin-offs in due course in promoting educational research. That in turn raised the problem of how it should relate to existing university-based organisations. That was a sensitive issue. The Society for Ed Higher Education was already there the standing conference in, in, in education also. But they managed to, to try to find some kind of notion of moving alongside them. And it was agreed reassuringly that there should be an establishment of informal relationships with other kindred organisations to avoid conflict and reduce duplication in activities. A sensitivity to common areas was agreed that it should strengthen the achievements of the association. A list would be drawn up of related organisations with a view to informing them of Bureau's purposes and activities. Relationships with Scotland also. There was already an established organisation and it was agreed that there should be a new association developed right at the same time as the new association for Britain itself. Again, there was some resistance to this, but it was agreed that that could happen. John Nisbet was the first president of Bira. His brother Stanley becoming the president for the Scottish Educational Research Association. This fraternal relationship between the new organisations maintained into the new century. CIRA formed at a meeting at the start of 75. There's also a possibility of a new European organisation, uh, but that wasn't followed through, and it was another 20 years before there was a new European Educational Research Association. So it's important to recognise that the founding ideals of BIRA favoured a university-based academic orientation and supported collaboration with established cognate organisations in a common cause of promoting educational research in a spirit of partnership. But we should also understand the contestation around particular issues, which tested the idea of partnership in different ways. Three key problems that it wasn't possible to settle in a speedy matter, manner were, first of all, the approach of teachers, secondly, the idea of interdisciplinarity, and third, the relationship between Bira and the central government department, at that time, the Department of Education and Science. 
initially there the economic orientation and the sensitivity to common areas. The academy and teachers. Vera might have started from a group on classroom research, but the issue of how school teachers might benefit from research was very keenly debated. Ben Morris of Bristol said that unless schools and their teachers are much more research-minded in a sense of being willing to check in some way their educational hunches, educational research is going to have remarkably little effect on the actual outcomes of education. Teachers could be awarded studentships, fellowships from the Research Council, but these were given too, harsh, too sparsely, too low a level financially to have a significant effect. So how could Beera help to address that issue? The first Beera president, John Nisbet, thought he had an answer. In an address to NFER's annual conference later in 74, he proposed that educational research could only have an indirect influence, but should have some effect on the attitudes of those who taught. Researchers and teachers, according to Nisbet, were fundamentally different from each other, but they should enter into what he called a marriage with distinct roles, a partnership. Researchers, in his view, having a very, very different kind of role from, from teachers. He saw researchers actually as promiscuous, irresponsible, indifferent to the fate of their offspring, which actually might have been grounds for divorce. But, but still, other early Bureau presidents, such as John Elliott and Lawrence Stenhouse, showed a lot more sensitivity. But certainly much was to be left and to be discussed in subsequent decades. It's this set of tensions present at the creation that helps to explain Beera's continuing and ongoing efforts to promote a research-informed teaching profession. Policies that have tended to separate teacher education from the environment of higher education have been subjected to critical scrutiny consistently by Beera, and many have objected also to the loss of history and theory from the teacher training curriculum. Current support for educational research close to practice maintains these concerns, and it's an issue that will surely continue to attract Beera's active attention. It's very consistent with the early aims and the conflicts which Beera found itself within. Interdisciplinarity, the second one. Interdisciplinarity, another issue that raised difficult questions. It's notable, I think, that the early leaders of Beera supported a broad interdisciplinary approach in educational research. And indeed, that they warned of the risks of splintering into a large number of subdivisions. What were the implications here for the notion of intellectual or academic partnership? The first meeting in 73 favored what it called interdisciplinary commitment, so that whatever disciplines were relevant for educational research in a wider sense should be included. Yet they also warned that this might lead to an indiscriminate spawning of sections or a jamboree. Nisbet chose to present his inaugural address on the state of the art of educational research. He emphasised the growth of the field over the previous 30 years. And he said that this had carried with it the danger that the study of education might split up into less and less meaningful subdivisions. He took the opportunity to argue strongly against what he called a fissy parus trend in research and insisted that in educational research it was particularly important that the different aspects should not develop in isolation. As he said, the empirical social scientist needs to draw on history, on comparative studies, on philosophy. And there are other earlier presidents of the fledgling association from different specialisms and disciplinary backgrounds who agreed with this generalist outlook. Jack Wrigley from Reading, the intended interdisciplinary nature of Beera. He suggested that educational research was akin to engineering as a problem-solving subject, drawing on the disciplines of anthropology, philosophy, psychology and sociology 
due to its insights and techniques. Indeed, according to Wrigley, VERA ought to be an excellent organisation to promote the kind of interdisciplinary study necessary for good research. The bringing together of workers from the various disciplines should he help, help to expose the pitfalls due to blinkered thinking. And perhaps most strikingly, Brian Simon, a champion of his own subdiscipline, the history of education, argued in his pre presidential address two years later, entitled Educational Research Which Way, that beer represented a coming together from various disciplines, which would, he said, encourage submerging the undesirable aspects of contributing disciplines while extracting the most from them from the educational point of view. The focus of educational research, indeed, said Simon, must be education. And the overall function was to assist teachers, administrators, indeed all concerned in the field, to improve the quality of the educational process. And in so, he said, enhance the quality of life. And that would also include recognition of the restraints on the educational process, economic, social, political, ideological, which require analysis. Education in this sense was nothing less than the characteristic mode of development of human beings in society, something that we still know all too little about. And so, Simon concluded, it's with a more effective penetration into that extraordinarily complex dynamic process involved at many levels that educational research was specifically concerned. Over time, it seems to me, these kinds of interdisciplinary ideals largely receded to be replaced by a more specialist concern with particular disciplines, all doing very valuable work, but a fissiparous trend, in Nisbet's words, that actually require cooperation and partnership in order to achieve coherence for the field as a whole, and perhaps also to enhance the scope for a general philosophy of educational research, which was pursued in the 1960s and 1970s. Over the past decade, interdisciplinary approaches have continued to return to favour in higher education generally. The 2016 Higher Education British Academy report, Crossing Paths, insisted that there was a deep need to take active steps to promote interdisciplinarity. While maintaining vigorous disciplines, it sees interdisciplinary research as central to academic innovation, leading to new subdisciplines both within and across existing disciplines. How can educational research respond to this demand? Is there scope in the 21st century for a return to Beera's early ideals of partnership? And how might this be achieved? One way of scoping this might be to review the role of the many different journals and centres, societies and conferences that now occupy our field, to reflect on how well they take our field forward and how well they work together in a common cause. And that's a theme that I'd like to pursue, I think, during the course of my presidency over the next couple of years. And so to the third aspect, which I'm wanting to emphasise, the relationship between Bira and the central department. What kind of partnership can we find here? And here we return to the request for a small pump priming grant from the DES that got turned down. When Ed Stones wrote to the DES early in 73 to ask for a grant for a meeting to explore the possibility of establishing a new association, he was turned down flat and described it as a dusty answer. A lot of disquiet was expressed at that negative approach. Unfavourable comparisons were made between the department and the approach taken towards research in other countries. What were the reasons for this? Well, in the House of Commons debate in 62, the then Minister of Education in the Conservative government, Sir David Eccles, had gone out of his way to emphasise the importance of academic research based outside the ministry. He agreed that research has to have a certain scepticism about it, and that there naturally ought to be complete freedom for people outside to say 
the minister is asleep. He does not realise that this one looking into, we think it should be, may we have some help. And he hoped that an increasing number of such applications would come forward. And yet officials in the department were suspicious of the value of academic research from an early stage. And they generally resisted attempts to set up independent institutions to support it. The new Society for Research in Higher Education, when it was set up, had also asked for money. And it took six months to get a third of what they'd asked for, just in time for Christmas. And DES resistance to that sort of application hardened further in the early 1970s. In June 1970, a Conservative government came to power with Mrs Margaret Thatcher as the new Secretary of State for Education and Science. And that signalled a change of approach from one of patronage to one that was policy-oriented, as it was put. Researchers seeking funds should apply to the Research Council or other funding agencies, and the department would only support an application if it was directly related to the department's own policies or deemed to be of direct public concern. And at the same time, it was observed that academic research wasn't the same as research conducted within the department. A, a great example, George Barron at the Institute of Education, the first professor of education administration in the UK, applying for funding to start a de development unit in education administration. And they didn't like that one either. It was met with hostility from department officials, administrators, saying it must be questioned whether academics are the best qualified or otherwise suitable people to set the pace in operational reform of this kind. And indeed, the new planning unit created within the department in the early 70s acknowledged that educational research now had a number of research workers of sound academic reputation but said that they had two fixed prejudices and ideas about the direction in which education ought to be moving. That these prejudices tend to spill over into the research and that they're not unbiased. And by contrast, they preferred to look for what they called hack research workers. Not hack, they said, in a derogatory sense, but people who get down to a job of fact-gathering and careful assessment without having too many preconceived ideas about where the educational system ought to be going. And here lay the basis for a divergence between the department and university research, and in the end, the seeds of conflict between the state and university-based research that became evident in the 1980s and 1990s. A failed grant application, more often than not, leads to the quiet end of a project. But rather than stifling the nascent beer at, at birth, the department's approach actually forced it to depend on the resources available to university-based educational researchers. It wouldn't be dependent on the generosity of state funding, which might be vulnerable to changes in government policy. Instead, it would be an independent agency standing on its own feet, accountable above all to its own membership for its future direction. In this sense, I think, ironically, Vera has a lot to thank Mrs Thatcher for. Moreover, as Nisbet maintained, such research had a critical role, that is, providing constructive criticism. And it was for this reason, he added, that there would be differences or tensions between the researchers and the practitioner, and as he might have added, the policymaker as well. There have been unfortunate consequences for education policymaking. Rather than the receptive approach to constructive criticism suggested by Eccles, there's too often been hostility and lack of a sense of partnership reflected both in the approach of policymakers and often in the responses of researchers themselves. For education policy itself, this reached its nadir when experts only a few years ago were dismissed as the blob. But more generally, when policies are based on hunches rather than on evidence, or drawn from nostalgic memories of personal and family memories of the grammar schools and independent schools of 50 years ago, and when restrictions on overseas students, for example, can be characterised as what one newspaper called a stupid idea based on bad data. 
Or one can think of other ideas gone west, revising the GCSE grades, for example, or university technical colleges, or school breakfasts, or early care provision. And there are days when we can recall Fred Clark's remarks of over 70 years ago and wonder how much has changed. So the question has to be, can educational researchers contribute to policy in such a context? There should be scope for engagement based on Eccles' original assertions about the need for research to have a certain scepticism. Trained researchers with ideas and minds of their own should be enabled and encouraged to contribute and indeed to challenge the fixed assumptions about the future in a spirit of partnership as critical friends. And that also goes for trained teams of researchers, specialist centres, special interest groups, societies and associations. And it was again Simon's presidential address of 1977 that proposed the way forward. The real issue, Simon said, was whether scientists are allowed to operate as scientists, educationists as educationists, researchers as researchers, or whether all are to become service personnel, waiting cap in hand for orders in response to which appropriate methods will be sorted out to produce acceptable results or conclusions. Educational research, he concluded, was like education itself, open-ended in contrast with technological servicing. It didn't abide by a given set of assumptions or goals. And he concluded really strikingly and in terms that really deserve attention today. The pressures now are for technological solutions in the service of certain immediate policies or for unequivocal statements. But educational research, any research, is good insofar as there is an awareness not only of achievements but also of limitations, insofar as researchers come clean, make explicit not merely findings but what they haven't done and what they can't do, even if this means the customer gets a dusty answer for their money or for setting the wrong set of questions. Simon was asking which way for educational research. Exactly 40 years on from that presidential address, that question mark must remain. And rightly so, because there always has to be debate and discussion about our future direction. Preparing for our golden jubilee of this association seven years away in 2024, should present us with further opportunities, not only for celebration, but also for critical reflection about our past and our future. Yet at present, I doubt that we can find a better answer to the question, educational research, which way now? Fundamentally, Biera carved out a space for academic research in education of the highest quality alongside the state, but wary and sceptical of it in partnership with practitioners, but independently and with a critical edge. It's our collective responsibility to take this forward for the researchers of the next generation and to build further partnerships both nationally and internationally. And for me personally, if I make out a list of things that I look for in educational research, I think of things such as these that it should be interesting and lively, irrelevant, as well as systematic and logical. That it should be deep and reflective, as well as broad in its implications. There should be an eye towards being creative and imaginative, as well as authoritative and wise, if we can. Both theoretically significant and empirically strong, both for understanding and for improvement. Critical, but with scholarly detachment. Rich in detail, but with an eye for the large scale and for the big picture. Interdisciplinary, as well as multidisciplinary, and engaging with single disciplines. Helpful where possible, but inconvenient where necessary. 
Maybe not all of these at the same time, fair enough, but at least with an eye to trying to bring together as many of these as we can. And that, I think, is what Vera means to me. Informed by its history. In 2017, a historical analysis locating Vera in its changing social and political context. From its early origins as a small group interested in classroom research is both necessary and, I think, fundamental to confirm its crucial place in the development of educational research and, I think, its importance for the future. Thank you very much.